Hello and welcome to the Business Summer Series. I'm Alicia Barry. Up and down the country, properties have been going under the hammer at record prices. 2021 saw the fastest annual growth in 22 years, with Australian real estate now valued at more than $9 trillion. It's great news if you already own your own home, but if you're a first home buyer trying to get onto the property ladder, the great Australian dream is getting further out of reach. Here's Rihanna Whitson. This young family lives in Australia's least affordable rental market. They're priced out of buying their own home. The emotional toll and side of it is really what made us decide to stop looking for now. Property prices across the country have grown 22% in a year. Hobart's had the biggest annual growth, followed by Sydney and Brisbane. And values in the regions have outpaced those in capital cities. Annual appreciation in housing values that we've seen is the highest 12-month uh, growth rate since 1989 and rental values have also grown uh, since their highest levels um, since the early 2000s, so sitting about 9% higher. The number of new loans being taken out by first-home buyers has fallen by 11%, while the amount borrowed by them is up 1%. Instead, more of them are purchasing an investment property, with 6.8% rent vesting in 2021, compared to 4.5% the previous year. Overall, the value of investor mortgages rose 83%. Record low mortgage rates below 2% have fuelled the property frenzy. But the cheap money is coming to an end. The RBA has signalled it could lift the cash rate as early as 2023. Banks have already started hiking fixed rates, while cutting variable rates to attract new customers. Banks are focused on gradually nudging up rates, and so borrowers need to be prepared to pay more the pace of growth in the housing market is slowing due to rising mortgage rates, stricter lending rules and more properties up for sale. But the big banks are still tipping price rises of between 6 and 8% in 2022, before values drop in 2023. CBA is forecasting the steepest fall of 10%. Some analysts warn that if new COVID variants caused lengthy lockdowns, house prices could continue to grow in the double digits. The Reserve Bank of Australia would hold fire on any planned interest rate rises and potentially the financial regulator, APRA, would also hold fire on any additional intervention to restrict credit in the housing market. In Brisbane, buyer's agent Wendy Russell's never been busier. And I call it Southern Money is coming into Brisbane and what they're doing is they're, they're coming in with big cash budgets and they're cash buyers. As the gap between housing and unit values grows to nearly 38%, 2022 is set to see high density living become more appealing because it's more affordable. We are seeing people, on average, uh, being able to borrow about 5% less than they would have, say, two months ago. Wow, 900,000 <laughs> amount, Denise. After spending months watching house prices soar, this couple decided to buy a two-bedroom flat in Melbourne. It's probably that three to five year stepping stone um, before we then look to what's that next step with the ultimate goal to get a house. Getting into the market any way they can. With me now is Eleanor Cray, Senior Economist at PropTrack. Eleanor, what do you think is going to happen in 2022? So we've seen already that the regulator APRA um, have made some changes that are going to reduce uh, borrowing capacity for new borrowers uh, just modestly at this stage. Um, we've also got people out and about in the economy again, spending on travel and entertainment. So it means that there's going to be slightly less money funneled into housing. And we've seen a large increase in the supply of properties for sale as well. So we've seen three consecutive months of uh, increased new listings. So there's a lot more choice out there for buyers. Uh, it's alleviating some of the froth at the margins and, and some of that sense of urgency. And I think those factors combined are, are fueling expectations of lower price growth. So what do you think the hottest markets will be? 
So we've seen that uh, price data is not showing any signs of slowdown in uh, Brisbane and Adelaide, but really it's southeast Queensland overall that continues uh, to remain in high demand, uh, particularly the Gold Coast and the Sunshine Coast. Uh, we've seen in the 12 months to, to March 2021, uh, interstate migration into Queensland was more than double the decade average as, as Southerners fled uh, for relatively lockdown free Queensland. Um, and we expect that those trends have continued and it's actually a trend that was about prior to the pandemic but we've really seen that the pandemic has supersized that trend. Uh, when we look at uh, house prices in Sydney we've not seen that Sydney price premium so extreme as it is now. Uh, so there's certainly an affordability advantage in there. Uh, and I think as well, uh, you know, we've got the Olympics confirmation in 2032 uh, that's going to provide a, an ongoing pipeline of infrastructure spending and uh, jobs growth as well, which will support demand for the Southeast Queensland market. You mentioned that price premium in Sydney. Is that affordability constraint to some extent causing a slowing in price growth and also a little in Melbourne too? It is one of the reasons, but I think, um, you know, more broadly, price growth across the market in general is slowing as that tailwind of lower rates expires. For those who, who do own a home, uh, there's a lot of people sitting on a lot of equity, um, which is going to continue to support transactional volumes, I think, in the year ahead. When we look at Melbourne, I think, uh, you know, the market has really hit pause over the last year uh, because of the inability for, for private inspections. And uh, so I think in that sense, potentially we could see that Melbourne maybe is stronger for longer in terms of price growth. The regions were very popular during the lockdown period of the pandemic. How do you think they're going to perform as we move through the tail end of the pandemic? It's likely that we're going to see a demand for regional housing markets ease back to more average levels. Um, but I think when it comes to uh, the expectation over the long run, it's going to be those commutable regions that remain popular. Uh, so we do expect some degree of workplace flexibility to remain. Uh, and I think in that sense, people are able to stretch their commuting budget per se uh, a little bit further. And so it's those regions that are potentially within 200 kilometers of a state capital CBD where people People can really maintain the best of both worlds, the regional lifestyle uh, and office connections uh, that are going to remain popular. And of course the international border is open. Do you think an increase in net migration is going to drive up prices further? I think when it comes to the international borders, uh, the most prevalent impact on the housing market is going to be uh, on, likely on the rental market. Uh, so we know that uh, arrivals from overseas favour the inner city and the, and the CBD. And also when it comes to international students, it's those suburbs or towns that are close to universities. Uh, but when it comes to inner city rental markets, we've seen that throughout the pandemic, uh, rents haven't risen as quickly as they have in the outer suburbs or in regional areas and in some inner city markets rents have actually declined and as we see international borders reopen and, and the resumption of migration and international students arriving we're likely to see uh, that rental demand pick up uh, for those inner city suburbs uh, and I think that's actually something that we're probably going to see investors capitalizing on. Eleanor Cray it's always good to talk to you thank you. Thank you for having me. And prices could rise even higher if hundreds of thousands of migrants come to Australia in the next few years. That's the warning from some economists who are calling on governments to build more housing to keep up with rising demand. Here's Nassim Kadem. Like most migrants who come to Australia, Punima Balasupramanyan feels lucky to call it home. She moved from Singapore to Melbourne with her husband and daughter almost four years ago. I am constantly preaching to my family and to my friends to move to Australia. Punima came on a student visa, but is now working as a kindergarten hey. teacher. No, it's not going very well. Uh, I think I've exhausted all the neighbourhoods we were looking at. The family are ready to buy their own home, but the options are limited. I'm so close to just quitting, but I know I've got to yeah, find some sort of solution because we, we just can't look at renting for the rest of our lives. While immigration is not the only factor influencing property prices, it does increase demand for housing. 
Economists say about one extra home is needed for every three migrants. Research shows if 250,000 people came to Australia in 2023, that would turn a house price fall into price gains of about 5%. It will also put more pressure on rents, with prices lifting by about 7%. If immigration were to come back rapidly, we would see significant upward pressure on rents and significant upwards pressure on house prices. So we'll be uh, well down into single digit growth, I think, by the time we get into next year and into 23. A federal inquiry is currently looking at the issue of housing affordability. One of the ways to keep prices within the reach of Australians is to build more properties. The Reserve Bank says the supply of homes has kept up with population growth, but finding land in inner city areas where people want to live is still a challenge. Government's got to both return immigration, but also have their planning systems deliver more planning uh, approvals to allow the private sector to go and deliver more houses so we don't get a rapid escalation in housing prices and rental prices going forward. In Sydney's hot housing market, former migrant, now Australian citizen, Sid Lal, has looked at hundreds of properties, but is also struggling to find one. We are having to extend our budget significantly um, because you know what was available uh, a year ago at the price point has now gone up by I would say easy 20 percent. Like most migrants who come here to work or study he's rented for a few years. Now he's looking to buy a property and may need to move further out of Sydney. With a new wave of uh, migrants coming in there's going to be a new wave of money and uh, property prices are probably going to increase even further. Paul, nice, nice to meet you, Paul. Nice to meet you. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. Punima and her partner Harish want Australia to embrace migrants and want more affordable housing. Our heads are reeling and we're just not able to figure out where um, we're going to get the funds for this. We're sort of stuck in like a dead end road and we're just hoping that some path is going to open up. Many others are also hoping for an easier path towards their dream home. 2021 has kept the best till last. So there's the winner. Tom Panos, freelance auctioneer, is with me now. Tom, what do potential buyers need to make sure they have in place before they attend on auction day? They've got to make sure that their paperwork with the bank is very solid. APRA has really tightened up restrictions and what's happening is banks uh, are not giving the money out they were previously. Particularly if you're a first home buyer, what you can borrow has actually been reduced roughly to around 5%. So there's no point going to an auction, bidding on a property, thinking to yourself, hey, three months ago I knew I could go to a million dollars and then find out that you bought at auction, quiz auction, there's no cooling off period and then you're stuck with having a shortfall of funds to settle. And when you do get those funds, how important is it to make sure that that deposit is ready to go on the day if you are to win? Well, look, we've just finished an auction here and what's happening is people are inside signing a contract and paying a deposit. The laws with auctions are you must pay a deposit as soon as practicable on the fall of the hammer. And essentially what you're saying is have the money with you when you come to an auction. A lot of people are doing EFT now, but a lot of people still use cheques. Have the money with you. And when it comes to the property that you're looking to buy, what would you say around due diligence? Because as you say, there's no cooling off period. What you buy is what you get. Okay, so if you're buying a home that's renovated, you probably want to get a pest and building inspection. And the reason why is that you're actually paying for something that's nice. You want to make sure that there's nothing that's been hidden, like, you know, structural damage. When you're buying a home that's land value, getting a pistol building inspection is not such a big deal because chances are you're going to be building something on there anyway. Other things that you should be checking 100% is get a lawyer to check the contract. You want to make sure there's nothing in that contract that's going to adversely affect the property. Um, you want to look at the zoning certificate. There are some properties that have got uh, a zoning that is not suitable for that property. It could be illegally built. And then one of the most important things is uh, uh, occupation certificate because people do work to homes and sometimes they don't get approval. You end up buying the property and you find out that the original buyer hadn't gone off and got approval to put that extension in or a granny flat or what have you. And when it comes to building and pest inspections, should you rely on the one the agent gives you or should you do your own, do you think? 
Look, today we've got tech tools. Technology, during COVID, there was a thing called COVID Clarity, which basically changed the way technology interacts with real estate buyers. You can get pissed in building inspections that are provided um, up front. Various companies do it, like before you bid and what have you. Um, so you'll find that no company that does a pestle building report is going to put themselves in a situation where they're going to compromise their integrity. So I don't think that's an issue. Some buyers love bringing their own builder and of course every family seems to have the uncle who seems to know everything about a home. And is there anything that stands out to you that is a must do for a prospective buyer? Yes. <laughs> Do your due diligence on values. Look at comparable sales. You can go to websites now and have a really good idea of what the market's doing. The biggest mistake people do is they look at one area, they get comfortable with the values, they miss out, they get disheartened in that area, and then they go to another area, they see a home and they pay top dollar not knowing what the values are there. So do due diligence. Make Google your best friend during your real estate journey. Tom Panos, thanks so much for your time. Thank you so much. It's a bank that lends at 0%. More than half of first home buyers are turning to their parents to get on the property ladder. On average, they're given over $97,000 according to research from Digital Finance Analytics. But property analysts warn regulators need to pay close attention as Rihanna Whitson's been finding out. When musicians Kate Goldby and Zach Anthony needed help buying their first home, they asked their parents. It would have been probably another 10 years of dedicated savings to be able to get even, you know, a 5% deposit for places as they, you know, prices were just going up and up and up. The answer was music to their ears. No. Zach's dad agreed to sign up as a guarantor for the loan. And so that meant that we were able to sort of get out of the rental market and, um, and get into our own place. A guarantor home loan is when a family member uses their home equity as security to boost the buyer's cash deposit. It means the buyer avoids paying costly lender's mortgage insurance. And if they default on the loan, the guarantor is liable for the repayments. Over the last three years, we've seen about 70% of my first home buyer clients uh, receiving help from their parents either with a non-refundable gift or a security guarantee, family pledge guarantee. The big four banks say the number of first-time buyers using guarantor loans has remained steady. 20% a year at the Commonwealth Bank, 15% at Westpac, 11% at ANZ and only 1% at NAB, where instead 40% of home buyers need to pay for lenders' mortgage insurance. The lender wants to see 5% of genuine savings to show that they've been um, saving themselves. But if there's more than 10% deposit, generally the lender doesn't mind where it's come from. The banks don't keep data on cash loans or gifts. Research suggests that Bank of Mum and Dad is now unofficially the country's ninth biggest lender. Housing analyst Martin North says it's a regulatory blind spot. If you're very fortunate to be in the category where your parents have cash they can give you, then you can go buy a property. But my concern relates to those who don't have access to that. The extra cash from mum and dad gives first home buyers more borrowing power, and there's concern that's contributing to the current buying frenzy and affecting house prices. People who got such a gift from parents or a loan from parents are three times more likely to default on their loan over the subsequent five years. And if prices do come off their tops later, they could even end up in negative equity. So for all those reasons, I think we should be very cautious. And yes, I think the regulators should be looking at this very seriously. Kate and Zach recently sold their house, released Zach's dad as guarantor, and are building their dream house on the coast. Bamboo. Yeah, <laughs> that's bamboo floorboards. Ooh. We've got a bigger place, we've got room for, you know, everyone has their own bedroom, we've got a studio, we've got 20 minute walk to the beach, it's going to be, yeah, really nice. For this young family, it's been a risk that's paid off. It's an older home, uh, early 50s home. Come on in, okay. I'll show you through. Thank you. Got your kitchen. So it's a two bedroom home. This is your the lounge room area. You've got that big 
full window view there, straight out to the bay. After you. So Jonathan, how do you put a value on properties, particularly a unique one like this? Yeah, look, when there's not a lot of comparable sales, I think um, feedback from purchasers is the most important. Every inspection matters, um, plenty of follow up as well. And then just try and give as much of that feedback as you can to the vendor to, to keep guiding accurately for the day. And what would you say to buyers who are trying to do their own research? Where should they look when they're trying to look for the price of a particular property they'd like to bid for? Look, be open and upfront with the agent. Uh, if you are genuinely interested in a property, if you do make offers prior, the agent does take on that feedback and that will either increase or decrease their guide so that everyone can be guiding accurately. If we received offers prior for, for a home like this, for example, you know, it's, you, you can kind of gauge where, where people are and get multiple opinions. Speak to multiple local agents if you really are interested in the property. Um, Realestate.com, domain.com, all those different websites. So, yeah. Okay. Well, Jonathan, we appreciate your insights and thank you for having us today. My pleasure. Thank you. Economists say one way to make housing more affordable is to scrap negative gearing and the capital gains deduction. But that's not going to happen anytime soon. 2022 is an election year and both Labor and the Coalition know just how unpopular those policies are. The tax breaks have led to rising prices and given investors incentives to buy more properties. Here's Nassim Kadem. Darren Stone says finding a bargain in Perth's housing market is now near impossible. In the early 2000s, the self-employed builder purchased an investment property close to his home just north of the city's centre. Now he's looking to buy another. It's certainly a competitive market out there at the moment to buy new sites. Anything you look at at the moment, um, there's definitely uh, a, a piece of overpaying going on in certain sites. Low interest rates and generous tax breaks have encouraged more investors like Darren to pile into the market. It does now seem that investors, combined with second-time buyers who are seeking to upgrade their homes, are once again squeezing would-be first-home buyers out of the market. Of the 2.2 million Australians renting out at least one property, 1.3 million declared a net rental loss in 2018-19. Most landlords have one property they negatively gear, but there are thousands who claim the tax break on at least six. Economists say when rates begin to rise, that could pose a threat. Well, the risks, as were clearly exposed during America's housing meltdown in the lead up to the global financial crisis of a dozen or so years ago, is that people who go into home ownership with very thin margins of equity can be in serious trouble if house prices fall and can also be in serious trouble if interest rates go up significantly. Australia is not the only country with unaffordable housing. In New Zealand, house prices have leapt by about 30% over the past year, but its government has axed their version of negative gearing in a bid to cool investor demand and make it easier for first home buyers to enter the market. If you took away some of these tax concessions, it's not going to be a silver bullet for affordability. You might only wipe a couple of percentage points off the overall price. Uh, but what it does is mean that you're going to have more homeowners in the mix and fewer investors. The Property Council says modelling it commissioned from Deloitte Access Economics shows cutting these tax breaks would hurt the economy. It would pitch up rents, it would have an impact on construction and it would have a big drag on economic growth, a $1.5 billion impact on GDP. Afternoon, I'd like to inquire about that 4x2. Darren hopes the tax breaks are here to stay to ensure the investment delivers the financial return he needs. If that advantage is taken away, then you'd really have to look closer to make sure the metrics in terms of the income you're going to produce. His property is positively geared thanks to low interest rates, but it won't stay that way forever. And while life in the country may be more appealing for many Australians, economists warn they may not be getting the services that they're used to, as Amelia Turzon has been finding out. Moving to the country has never been more alluring for Australians. 
this young family is taking a leap of faith Yay! to escape city life during the pandemic. There's no traffic lights to get to work. The weather's been a lot better. <laughs> Jessica's originally from regional Victoria, but for Melbourne-born Jeff, it's a new lifestyle. I've been able to go to a farm and chop up some wood, which is not what you do in the city. But finding somewhere to live has been surprisingly stressful. And there are only three rental properties in the whole greater Wangaratta area. We were really lucky that um, Jeff's new work managed to find this place for us, so very lucky. Prices are soaring in housing markets right across regional Australia. Another new family in town is loving the laid-back lifestyle. But with just one car, they're struggling with Wangaratta's limited public transport. It's a bit of a culture shock because in the old days you, we, could, we lived near a station, we could get on the train, be in the city in 40 minutes. There's also long wait lists to see a doctor. Some of their websites actually say we're not taking on new patients. There's one or two um, surgeries that are taking patients and one of them is sort of on the other side of town. The region's local member wants more investment in services if people keep moving here. But what surprises people is that unlike a metropolitan centre like Melbourne, for example, where there's hot and cold running services, the further you get away from a metropolitan centre, the less chance you have of being able to get those kinds of services readily. Demographers say with populations far lower than big cities, services in regional towns are always a step behind. There's most definitely an economic side to uh, the, the demand for services and so money flows with the demand. There's a lot to love about country life, but there's obviously a service gap and the tyranny of distance. As people flood to the regions from capital cities in the last year, only time will tell if they stay here long term. Many people moving to the regional areas will soon discover that it's not all that it's cracked up to be because the infrastructure is lagging. Denise and Jeremy plan to stay long term as long as they can find a forever home. I don't know if everyone um, can handle what the change is like when they're really here. Jessica and Jeff are also deciding if the change is right for them. Yay! I think we'll just give it a go and, and see what happens and see if we like it, see how we fit into the community. Giving a tree change time to grow. And that's all from our summer series special on property. For more on our business stories, you can jump on our website or head to iView. I'm Alicia Barry. Thanks for watching.